Hi and welcome to a Calculus 1 video on critical values. So let's take a look at this general graph that we have drawn. First of all, it is important to note that we are on a closed interval, so we are looking from x equals a to x equals b, for example. And then the next thing to note is we have a few special points that I'd like to point out. All of these points where I drew the tangent line that appears to be horizontal, we're going to call those turning points or relative or local maxes or mins. We would find those relative or local max or mins by setting the first derivative equal to zero. Since the tangent line is horizontal in each of those cases, and the tangent line is represented by a first derivative, we find that algebraically by setting our first derivative equal to zero. A relative or local minimum is defined as where a function is decreasing, then it turns around and increases. So this would be a relative or local minimum, as well as this point over here, because we're decreasing and then turning around and increasing. Now a relative or local maximum is defined as a point who is increasing, then turns around and decreases. And so I can see that by increasing to it and decreasing after. Now points that are the end points, since we are on a closed interval, we have two end points. And it is possible that our end point is also a relative or local max or min. And it is also possible that our end point is the highest or the lowest point on the curve. So if I'm going to talk about absolute maxes or mins, I am looking for the highest y value in that closed interval. And so I'll go ahead and highlight that with the bright purple or pink color here. This appears to be the highest point in that closed interval. The lowest point appears to be down here. So I would call that not only is it a relative or local minimum, but it's also the absolute minimum. And then the, the point here to the far left, since it's the end point, it is also the highest y value on my curve. That would also be an absolute maximum. The absolute maximum and absolute minimum is literally the highest and the lowest y value that is defined in your closed interval. And the relative or local maximums and minimums are found because those are the turning points within that closed interval. So let's talk about how we can find that. Now the definition of a critical number is where your slope is zero and any new restrictions to the domain of f prime. I'm going to box the new restrictions. So what I have to look at is what is the domain of my original function followed by what is the domain of my derivative and compare the two. So let's take a look at a few examples here. Find any critical numbers of the following functions. So we're going to do this a few times here. So let's take a look at the first one g of x equals x squared times the quantity x squared minus 4. Although I could certainly use product rule, I'm not necessarily going to. I'm going to do a rewrite. So g of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 4x squared. And then I'd like you to pause for a second and write what is the domain of that initial function. Well, there are no restrictions to x in that g function. You could put anything in for x's. So my domain of that g function before I do the derivative is all real numbers or negative infinity to infinity. So let's find its derivative. So g prime of x equals 4x to the third minus 8x, just using power rule. And again, let's pause. We have a good derivative here, so let's go and find the domain. The domain of this g prime is still all reals or negative infinity to infinity because I can still put any value in for x. So I could also write the all real symbol. So I have no new restrictions. So I have no additional values to add to my critical value list. 
What I'm just going to look for is the first definition of critical values, which is where are my turning points in this original functions graph? So where are these possible turning points of relative or local maximums or minimums? Okay, so I'm looking for where is the first derivative equal to zero because that will give me where I have a horizontal tangent line. So I can solve this equation by factoring and using my zero product property to separate those factors out. And so I have three critical values. And again, I have no other restrictions, so no other values to add to that list. So these are giving me three points of interest, again, just the x values, that I might want to consider something is happening on my original function at these three values. Let's look at a different one. Let's look at 4x squared times 3 to the x as a function. This one's going to require product rule. But before I do that, I really want you to stop and pause and say, what is the domain? Because we have to get used to this or get in a good habit of finding this domain so we have something to compare the derivatives domain to. So I can put in anything I want for x. I can put in negatives. I can put in zero. I can put in positives. I can put in really large, really small. None of that matters. So this domain is non-restricted or again, all reals. And let's go ahead and find the derivative. So I am going to use product rule. So the derivative of 4x squared is 8x. Leave the 3 to the x alone. Plus I will leave the 4x squared. And then I'll do the derivative of 3 to the x, which is 3 to the x. Natural log of 3 technically times the derivative of x, which is 1. And again, I would highly recommend you pause and say, what is the domain of this derivative? We already have the domain of y. Now we're going to look at the domain of y prime. The same idea still occurs. I can put in any value I want for x, negatives, positives, large, small. So my domain is still negative infinity to infinity or all reals. I have no new restrictions when I compare them. So my only critical values are going to come from where does this first derivative, which I will just copy down, where does this equal zero? So I will factor. Again, I have two terms because I used product rules. So there's the yellow, that's my first term. Here's the green, which is my second term. So I will factor. So I can factor out a 3 to the x. That was just the obvious factor to me that I did first. But I can also factor out a 4x. And that's about it. OK, what am I left with? Well, in my first term or yellow term, um, I took out the 4 to the x factor, so, or excuse me, 4x, so 2, 3 to the x was also already factored out. Plus, for the green term, I'm going to be left with an x factor, the 3 to the x got factored out, and the natural log of 3. All right, so I'll use my zero product property to rewrite this and try to solve here. So 0 equals 3 to the x, 0 equals my second factor of 4x, or 0 equals 2 plus x times natural log of 3. 3 to the x, where is that 0? Well, again, this is an exponential function, so if x is positive, you're going to be repeatedly multiplying by 3. If x is 0, 3 to the 0 is 1. And if x is negative, that just means you're repeatedly dividing by 3. You are never, ever, ever going to get 0. You could prove it if you wanted to by taking the natural log of both sides. The x comes down in front, but we cannot do the natural log of 0 for that exact reason. So that part has no solutions. The second factor here gets me x equals 0. And the third, if I subtract 2, and then divide by natural log of 3. You do want to keep this exact. So I would just say x equals negative 2 over natural log of 3. So in this case, I have two critical values because, again, I had nothing else to add from any new restrictions to my domain. All right, so let's look at one where the domain is a little bit more interesting. So let's look at our original. And before we rewrite this with fractional exponents, I would like you to consider what the domain is now. I think that that will be easier for you. So this is square root of x. And we should know then that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. 
So if that's the way you wanted to write it, that was fine, because again, I have a square root or an even root, so I need that radicand to be positive or zero. I would write that in interval notation with a bracket zero to infinity, so if that's easier for you to understand, that's fine too. If a number line is easier for you, go ahead and draw a number line. I will do a rewrite before I start talking about this derivative. So my original function, if this is x to the one-half, I will distribute that into the parentheses. So that makes x to the three-halves minus one x to the one-half. Again, that's just that rewrite. So I'm ready now to do the derivative. Okay, we should be comfortable with our rewrites at this point in a Calculus 1 course so that we can be successful with our derivatives. So this will be 3 halves x to the half minus 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And again, before you state what the domain is, I really think that you should put this with the square root so you can see it a little bit better. So this is just a rewrite of your derivative. This would be 3 halves times the square root of x, right, x to the 1 half is the square root of x, minus 1 half, and this is the square root of x, but in the denominator. So if we look at this domain, again, we gotta think about our continuity of our function here, or where am I defined? Well, this first derivative is only defined not just for values greater than or equal to zero, but now if I include zero, I'm in trouble because I have a square root of x in the denominator. So if x is zero, I have zero in the denominator. I don't want that. So now my domain is x is greater than zero or non-inclusive zero to infinity, okay? So I do have a new restriction at x equals zero. So I'm going to include that in my list of critical values. Again, this list of critical values is giving me some important points that I want to pay attention to. The derivative is providing me information about the original function so that I'm eventually going to be able to graph it on my own. So let's set this equal to zero and solve. When I have two fractions like this, one technique might be to add this one over two red x to the other side. This square root of x is in the numerator, so if you wanted to look at it like so, you can. You can multiply both sides by two times two red x, or by two red x, or um, however you get to this next step is okay. So two equals six times square root of x times square root of x is x and so x equals one-third. What is important to note is sometimes when you're solving these problems, you might gain extra solutions. If you thought x should equal zero, you are not correct. x equals zero is not a solution to the first derivative. It is rather a new restriction. So let me show you what I mean about sometimes you might get that as looking like it might be a solution, but it's not. If I write these with their exponents, many people multiply by two so they don't have to deal with fractions anymore, which is great. And then there is a technique where it says, okay, factor out an x. Well, I'm gonna factor out x to the negative one half because that's my smallest exponent. And then that would leave me with three x to the first, because negative a half and one would be positive a half, so if I distributed that back out, I get my first term, then minus one. And if I use zero product property, here's my x equals one-third answer that we got before, and a lot of people put x equals zero right here, and that is not true at all. This is saying one over x to the half equals zero, and if you try to solve this, you should see that that provides you with no real solutions. Okay, so it's not that x equals zero, it's that zero is a new restriction to our domain, so it's just an important point that I wanna pay attention to here in the future. Okay, I think that's it for this video. So I have shown you the beginnings of what it looks like to have a new restriction. There will be another video coming up where we have a few more that we're gonna look at how to find the critical values of. Thanks for watching, I hope you found this video helpful.